my tech career started off as a national instructor for a big box computer chain store. And the cool part was they didn't care where you lived because they would fly you around the country to train and travel people. Now this was back in the green screen days, so there was no like super cool interface or anything that you all probably have created wonderfully and beautifully in your careers. Um, I was living in New Jersey at the time and I had visited San Diego a lot because my friend had moved here. And I thought, well, since they don't care where I live, I'll just move there because hello, have you seen the view? It's pretty red. Um, and this is the view from the end of my block. The sunset is ridiculously obnoxious. So I followed my friend a number of years later, and three days after I got here, the big box chain laid me off. I had $600 in my bank account. Rent was due in two weeks. So I did what most kids do at my age. I called my parents freaking out. And my father said, well, Kara, it's fine. The worst that can happen is you move back home with us. <laughs> yeah, Dad, that is the worst that could happen. You are completely, completely correct. And I had a choice. There's a great Twitter satirist, Johnny Sun, and I love this slide because in that moment, the choice I had to make was, do I curl up in a ball in the corner in the fetal position or I'm in San Diego. You know what? Life's bad. Everyone's sad. We're all going to die. But I got this really cool bouncy house over here. So are you going to take off your shoes or what? In that moment, I decided to take my shoes off. So I opened up the Yellow Pages. Show of hands, how many people remember that big book that, yep, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Affectionately referred to as a doorstop. Opened it up and went to publications because I had been an English major in college. Called McGraw Hill in town, called a bunch of others, nobody was hiring. So naturally, I went to the next part of the Yellow Pages, which was public relations, hashtag alphabetical order. And the first one I called said, we just decided today to add a senior account manager. Why don't you come in for an interview? Now to be clear, I was 0% qualified for this, like negative 0% qualified for this. But I knew I could write, and I can talk a dog off a chuck wagon, so I said yes and went in, and I got the job. This was the first of many reinventions that I would go through in my career. My life is a series of moments where I'm trying to sneak up to the big kid's table without being noticed. I know you're all pausing because my pants are so awesome in this picture. <laughs> and I've been to a lot of big kid's tables from the White House, to TEDx, to TurboTax, to the Super Bowl and the Oscars. What I have found in my career through this journey is my joy comes from being able to create impact at scale and to be able to influence the conversation and steer the ship. So how did a kid from Jersey with a bachelor's degree in English and theater, of all things, end up in each of these places? Let's pause for a minute. <laughs> you probably think of one of two things when you think about New Jersey. You probably think of Newark Airport, or you think of this show. To be clear, none of these people are from New Jersey. I just want a level set. So how did a kid from Jersey do all those things? The truth is, because of her, it never occurred to me that I couldn't do or be anything I set my mind to. So shout out to moms. Today I'm going to go over three lessons, being a good designer and creative. There's been three patterns that have emerged throughout my career. Always say yes, connect the dots, and make your own opportunities. This one happens to be my personal mantra. So Women's World Cup 99. I was living in New Jersey. My soccer coach from when I was a club player as a kid said, can you hear they're looking for volunteers? And I was like, cool, let's do this, like, because I can't afford to buy tickets to the game, but sure, let's, let's volunteer. And they put me on the press operations team. So that meant as a, probably at that point, 15-year soccer player, and then I'd moved into coaching and refing. Um, this was a great opportunity to see my heroes from when I was a kid, Mia Hamm, Julie Foudy, Joy Fawcett, Shannon McMillan, 
play. So here I am at the opening ceremonies in Giant Stadium, watching them march in, and the pride was just overwhelming. And in the middle of the summer, I decided, I'm sorry, in the middle of the World Cup, I decided that was the time where I moved to San Diego. So you've got to remember, in the summer of 99, we weren't sure how the women were going to do. They were doing well. But then as I moved across the country, they started tracking like they were going to get into the finals. So when I got to San Diego, I called the head of press operations and I said, Jim, guess what? I'm in San Diego. I think you need me in the press box at the finals when the women play China. And he was like, well, of course we do. Come on up. So I went up and this shot I love because it's the moment where in the penalty kick, 90,000 people at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, Brandy Chastain kicks the winning uh, field goal. Wrong football. For the English people in the room, <laughs> I'm bilingual. Uh, <laughs> uh, she, she, uh, she, she kicked the winning penalty kick to win the Women's World Cup against China, and the place went wild. She rips off her shirt, 90,000 people are going crazy, it's July 10th, it's nuts. And I'm in the middle of all because I raised my hand and said yes to a volunteer opportunity. Shortly after, the league started, the Women's United Soccer Association, and we got a team in San Diego, which was fantastic. I was working in PR at the time, and the um, team practiced in La Jolla at Allen Field, and I was the league manager at the time on, as a side gig, um, a side hustle. And I got to know the team, I got to know the coaches, and they said, you know, we have an opening for a receptionist. Would you be interested in working for us? Yes, I absolutely would. I had a college degree. I didn't care that I was the receptionist because I was able to do something I loved. And during that time, we got news that San Diego was going to host the Super Bowl the following year. So I reached out to the director of volunteers. I said, hey, is it a possibility that you need somebody? They pulled me in. They looked at my resume. They said, actually, you know, because of your World Cup experience, would you like to run the press operations center for the Super Bowl? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I would, sure. Um, and a couple weeks went by, they actually ended up bringing in a firm to do it. They wanted, you know, an actual established group of humans to do it, not somebody who had been in the press box, apparently. Uh, totally legit, and I was out of a, a volunteer gig, but that was okay. I was just, it was an honor to be asked, it was an honor to be considered. Uh, and two weeks later, they said, well, you know, we need somebody to be our production coordinator for the halftime show. Could you do that? Yeah, yeah. Sure, I can totally handle that. So I had a team of 80 volunteers. Our job was to get the band, the stage, and the 100 fans on and off the field in six minutes. So we did that. So we're standing at the um, Qualcomm Stadium, final dress rehearsal the day before the Super Bowl, and the production team from LA, who was actually putting on the show, said, you know, Kara, we really like your how. Have you ever thought about moving to LA or working in entertainment? I had this whole thing that by the time I was 30, I wanted to have been in entertainment. I'd already checked off the box of by the time I was 30, I wanted to move to San Diego. Um, I don't know why 30 is a magic age. I think women might resonate more with that weird stat, but it was the goal in my head. And they said, um, we'd like to work with you if you ever move up to LA. I said, funny thing, I'm moving up in three weeks. And they said, oh, here, hands me a phone. I do an interview on the spot outside of Qualcomm. The interview goes great. They said, okay, you're in. And I said, I handed the phone back to Marge and I said, cool, I'm, I'm in, I start February 13th, but I don't know what I'm in for, what's your next gig? <laughs> the Oscars. The Oscars was their next gig. So, you know, think about that. I had volunteered for World Cup, I had volunteered for the Super Bowl, led to a paid gig. And I didn't volunteer for those things, because any other reason that I had a passion for them. And here it is, my first job in LA. Fast forward a number of years, and I saw a tweet from then US CTO at the White House, Todd Park, saying they were looking for a few good women and men, in that order, because Todd's awesome, <laughs> to serve their country in the first class of White House Presidential Innovation Fellows. Now, I worked at Intuit uh, for six years at the time. I was an innovation catalyst. It's their Design for Delight design thinking program. And I looked at the description on the White House website and I was like, oh, this is Innovation Catalyst. I can totally do this. So I applied. They had 800 people apply. They picked 18 people, two women. And by saying yes to that, I ended up here. Woo! 
The funny story about this is we had briefed President Obama in the Roosevelt Room, which is right across from the Oval Office, and they had seated me next to him at the table. And at the end of the meeting, he taps my, my hand and said, should we go get a picture in the Oval? Yes. <laughs> Sir. Um, you know, while always say yes may not come easy, and while it might be paid, it might be volunteer sometimes, if you have the courage to do it, you can end up in some really cool places. So let's go to connect the dots. Sometimes you might really want to do something, but the person who's hiring or the person who is in charge might not see why you are the right person for it. So spoiler alert, it's not on them to figure you out. It's on you to help them connect the dots. So up till this point, I had been known for two things. I had been known for big events, and instructional design, that's what my master's is in. When I moved to TurboTax, I met with the team, the interviews went great, and I met with the hiring manager last, and she's like, I'm just not seeing how an instructional designer can make the change to being a technical writer. And so I connected the dots where I was like, you know what, I totally get why it's not completely clear. Here's the thing, both of us have to do audience analysis. We have to figure out who the audience is, what level to write for them at, what they need, what the outcomes look like. Then we have to work with developers to get it built, we have to test it. And so by me connecting the dots, she went, oh yeah, I got it. And so then I worked there for six years, and it was a great opportunity, but the, the onus is on me. And so sometimes I think we just assume that we are being so clear in what we're saying that everyone's gonna get it. And so it's a good reminder that sometimes you have to put in the extra work to connect the dots for people. So let's say that you want to do a change and you're ready to connect the dots, you're ready to always say yes, but you're not sure what next should be. This is an exercise I have people do where you have to write it down on paper. You cannot do it as an Excel spreadsheet, you can't do it in PowerPoint or Keynote because I'm in a room of creatives. Um, you have to write it down. So you do two columns. You do what you're good at and what you're passionate about. Now what you're good at, that's the thing that everybody comes to you for, right? Like you're known for this. What you're passionate about is where your heart is tugging you these days. And then in the one corner, you make this little corner for stuff that you hate doing, like really hate doing, because you have to be honest with yourself. So for me, I'm good at writing, editing, strategy, end-to-end -end strategy especially, uh, UX, giving advice, creating awesome spaces for people to do the best work of the career. That's what I'm known for. What I'm passionate about is experience design, and especially shows and live events. My super most happiest place in the entire world is creating the show rundown. And for the Oscars and the Emmys and the TEDx, those are the things that are the second by second of what's happening. The lighting cue, the music, this person's talking for two minutes and 46 seconds, and you get down to the minute. That is my happy place. I get the agenda from the producer, I build the rundown in Excel, I'm a dork, I own it. I love it. Um, I'm also really good at big, meaty problems. That's what I, um, I get my fuel from, and then, then what I hate is meetings. <laughs> Not so much attending them, but if you want to see me just like melt into a puddle on the ground, tell me I have to organize something for like 550 people on a date that works for all of them. <sighs> Not so much. So what do you do? So you, you've done both columns, you've done your little hate corner. Um, the next thing is <laughs> you look for patterns. So walk away for a day, come back, and look for patterns both in the columns and across the columns. And then what that becomes is what you look next for in your opportunities. So throw away job titles, throw away the actual tasks you're doing, and look for the patterns. For me, my passions are around communications, puzzles, and humans. Um, you know, the things that, it's not literally the puzzles on the table, though they're fun and good. Um, it's those big, meaty problems. So when I look for my next opportunities, those are the things that I'm looking for when I read between the lines. So how about make your own opportunities? What does that look like? So I got into UX because I was working at a um, insurance company and I was an instructional designer and there was this group called New Media, which I'm totally dating myself, and they were creating this new e-learning, the first one the company ever had. And I said, oh, you need someone to write the script. I just came from Hollywood. I did a lot of script coordinating uh, and reviews. Do you want any help? And they're like, yes, who are you, you magical unicorn human? Uh, we would love your help. And I said, well, what else does your team do? And they said, well, we do this thing called usability. And I said, what's that? Go on. And they said, we put products in front of customers to test it, to see what's wrong with it before it goes live so we can work all the kinks out. And I was like, hold up, hold up, wait, wait. 
you get to be the person who is the voice of the user in the meetings with marketing, product, engineering, and everyone else, and you're their advocate, sign me up. So I walked into my boss's office. I was like, Bill, this is awesome. Loving instructional design. Can do it in my sleep. I want to rewrite my job description so it's 25% new media, 75% instructional design. He was like, sure, I'll sign off on it. And so that's how I started. And every job from that point on, I started doing a little more UX, a little more, a little more, until finally at TurboTax, I was able to get a job where I was doing UX as my full-time position. So I made my own opportunities. I know everyone in this room has seen a TED Talk or seven. <laughs> what you might not know is that the TEDx program was started in 2009 as a, an offshoot of the TED program. They wanted to give more people access than just the big conference every year. And I heard we were getting one in San Diego. And how cool was that? So I went to their website and I clicked on the volunteer link and I said, I will be your janitor. I don't care. Because here's the thing. None of us are above making coffee. None of us are above making copies. You have to pay attention to those things. You have to pay your dues to get up to the level where you're setting the strategy. So I said, I'll be your janitor. I don't care. And then I also said in parentheses, by the way, I've worked on the Oscars and Emmys and other big shows if you think that would help. <laughs> And five minutes later, I got a call, and Jack Abbott said, we actually need a director. Can you direct the show? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I totally can. And at that point, I actually was qualified to do this, as opposed to the earlier uh, examples where I eh, was a little qualified, but had a lot of chutzpah because I'm from Jersey. Um, so a lot of this is about, you know, sometimes it's at work you create your opportunities. Sometimes you're volunteering and creating them, right? Because here's the thing. The word manager is a job. The word leader is a mindset. So you can be a leader. It could be maybe you're really good at designing and you do a, a camp for kids to teach them how to design or you go into a women's shelter to teach them how to do resumes or you, know, you go somewhere, uh, a nonprofit in your neighborhood or your town who needs your graphic design skills, right? You're leading projects. And even at work, I would argue, if you're a designer leading a cross-functional project, you're leading that team. So remember, that is a mindset, not a job. Um, at Intuit, you know, the, part of this is about hacking the system too. At Intuit, we have 10% time. So I use my 10% time, which means you can do whatever you want on structure, blah, blah, blah. Um, I used mine to create TEDx Intuit. And I went to the SVP and I said, here's the budget I'm asking for, here's the ROI for employees. I spoke their language, so I said all of the sessions at TEDx Intuit are going to ladder up to our leadership success profile. He signed off on it. Our net promoter score in our first year was 96. And I executive produced that for the next five years. That's a leadership opportunity. I created it. It doesn't have to be that grand. Again, it can be small. You can be volunteering. You can be leading. You can be coaching. You can be mentoring. Those are all opportunities that then go on your resume and set you up for future success. The thing I know about creatives is you're very good at hacking the system. So think about, in the mindset of making your opportunities, like how can you hack what's already around you? Find out you know, what that passion is and do that. Let's talk about this for a second. <laughs> the what and the how. The what is the results you produce. The how is the way you get there, how you interact, how you lead, how you show up. It doesn't matter if you nail whatever you're supposed to be building or creating. If you burn the team on the path to getting there, no one will want to work with you again. So I encourage you to think about how you're showing up, how you treat people, what you say to them, how you make them feel, because that will make you the kind of leader that people will line up to work with you again. So over the years, these are another four patterns that have shown up in my leadership style. Empower the team. Trust that they can do what you brought them in to do. Believe that they will deliver what they say they can deliver. Now, mind you, I check in. It's not just, here, go do it, run out, have a blast. Um, but that starts with rallying them around the clause. Have a vision. Have it written down. Make sure everybody knows it. I'm not saying go put posters on walls everywhere, but make sure everyone at the top of drop of a hat can say what it is. Be humble. You don't know everything, and that's OK. But know what you don't know and surround yourself with people who can fill in those blind spots and help you when you can't figure something out. Know what you don't know, embrace it, and find your tribe. And then give away the glory is my favorite. Um, 
you don't always have to be the person to do the interview or the talk or the person who writes the article. Look around especially for people who are not always represented. It does not always have to be the same person talking, especially make sure you're reaching out to women, to people of color, LGBT. These are people who do not get the shine usually as much as the people who always do. So find people who are in the non-majority, raise them up, lift them up, give away the glory, and give them shine. <laughs> My last project in government was the Cancer Moonshot. And I will let President Obama tell you a little bit about that. You know, last year, Vice President Biden said that with a new moonshot, America can cure cancer. Last month, he worked with this Congress to give scientists at the National Institutes of Health the strongest resources that they've had in over a decade. Well, So, so tonight I'm announcing a new national effort to get it done. And because he's gone to the mat for all of us on so many issues over the past 40 years, I'm putting Joe in charge of mission control. For the loved ones we've all lost, for the families that we can still save, let's make America the country that cures cancer once and for all. What do you say, Joe? Let's make it happen. So I led the team who, in the Cancer Moonshot, our goal originally had been to make ourselves the country that cured cancer. A bit ambitious for the 11th month time period we had before, between then and the end of the administration. So the 10 of us who came together to work on this team quickly uh, pivoted, and we said we want to make 10 years worth of advancements in the next five. My team focused on cancer clinical trials and getting people to consider doing them. Right now, only 4 to 6% of adults who get cancer. Uh, due to clinical trials. So for us to accelerate that timeline, we wanted to really understand where is it in the cancer patient journey line where people are going to be most likely to consider a clinical trial. We run around, this is the journey map that was the result of our two-month study. We went around the country everywhere from Dana-Farber Institute in Boston, Massachusetts and community health care centers there to the Navajo Nation Reservation two hours west of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And what we found is doctors have 15 minutes to prep to see a patient, 15 minutes to see a patient. So we talked to doctors, cancer patients, sidekicks, loved ones, technology groups who are trying to save this or to work on this. We talked to advocacy groups who are passionate about this. And in this journey map, we realized the biggest opportunity to make the biggest difference in consideration is the oh shit moment. It's the moment you realize you have cancer when you're sitting in the doctor's office. So a lot of the work we did focused on that moment and how can we set doctors and nurses and patients and everybody up for success. Part of the work was also hosting a Cancer Moonshot Summit at the White House. We had over um, 700 folks uh, around the country in all 50 states and Guam and Puerto Rico hosting viewing parties. We brought 400 people together at the White House to talk through all the different parts of the moonshot and how we can make it work. Uh, the hashtag was can serve. Uh, my team, we shipped a redesigned trials.cancer.gov uh, using a lot of best practices from the private sector and a lot of A-B testing and user research to make it a more, I hate to say the word delightful in regards to cancer, but a more usable experience and making it more likely for them to find what they need in their moment of need. We also shipped cancer.serve.gov, which if you want to volunteer for cancer-related opportunities in your community, you can do that. And there were some cool things in there. It's like the person who goes to the hospital to play their guitar, they need a volunteer to walk around with them and carry the guitar case. So there are some really cool things that you're like, oh, I can help. I can do something about it. When we were briefing Vice President Biden in his West Wing office on this, um, it was really cool because when we walked in, he's like, oh, good, the technologists are here. Tell me what I need to know. The way I actually got involved in the project was I was taking a class called How Congress Operates. Um, 
It was a week-long course. Uh, Georgetown put it on. So I was actually down in the basement of Congress when I got the phone call from Vice President Biden's Director of Digital Strategy, Lindsay. And she said, listen, I have this really cool idea for how we can go after the cancer moonshot from a tech perspective, but I need a creative technologist. Can you help? And at the end of the conversation, I said to her, I wasn't born to do this work. I survived to do it. Because I'm a three-time cancer survivor. So this work was highly, highly personal to me. And it was the honor of a lifetime to be able to raise my hand and say yes to this. This, this is the power of good design. It can move mountains. It can change worldviews. It can save lives. If you aren't leaping out of bed every day, excited about what you do, why not? Change jobs, or if you can't because you need the benefits or you need the money, then find a nonprofit in your community where you can volunteer your services and help them. Find the thing that makes your heart sing. Screw your courage to the sticking place and say yes. Thank you.